everybody has heard about the good old days of railroading through our valley, but as it turns out, a comprehensive history and photos of the El Paso and Southwestern Railroad have been hard to find. Thankfully, Mike Anderson has smoothed all this out for us. Uh, Mike has been interested in Borderlands history for as long as he can remember. He taught Arizona and world history as a high school social studies teacher and is the author of the book Warren Ballpark. His numerous articles on Southern Arizona have been published in the Journal of Arizona History and the Journal of Cochise County History. He also has his own radio show on Bisbee's KBRP, a weekly comedy program. And Mike was a key researcher for and actor in tomorrow's film, Biz B17, which he'll introduce in person. Um, so don't miss that. Anyway, let's welcome Mike Anderson. I was really grateful when Kim invited me back. I did the Gadsden Purchase presentation last year. That's the most important thing that happened in the history of this area was when it became part of the United States. And then he says, are you willing to do something else? And I said, yeah, yes. And he said, uh, how about the EPA and SW? And I said, well, you know, if I can learn to spell it, I guess I can learn to research it. <laughs> so he gave me this wonderful topic to research. And I'm going to share what I learned. I knew a little bit about the El Paso and Southwestern from doing deep research on the Bisbee deportation. Because the railroad was the way that they transported those poor fellas from Bisbee to Columbus and then back to Ramones. But I didn't know a whole lot about railroads, and I didn't know a whole lot about this railroad and its <coughs> profound impact on what we are doing today. It is safe to say that if we were, if we did not have this railroad come through here, we would not be here today. There would be no rodeo. So that is the profound importance of the El Paso and Southwestern Railroad to this area. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is what was the El Paso, the EP and SW, as we say the railroad is, how was it started, how big did it get, what was life like in a railroad town like Rodeo or Animus or Hachita or Columbus or Tucson or Bisbee or Douglas, and how did it impact the community and what happened to the communities when it was over, when the railroad left. So we'll start there. This, by the way, is the logo for the EPNSW. This is on the uh, railroad station in Tucson, the depot that's down on Congress Street, right by the Federal Building. And it was the, it's a beautiful building. There's another one in Douglas. It's even larger and done by the same uh, architect. Beautiful building. We drive down 80 in Highway 9 all the time. And no matter where you are on that road, with few exceptions, you're looking at the railroad. The roadbed is right next to us. Culverts and bridges and signs for Apache, which was a railroad town. So it's all around us. It's around us so much and its, its presence is so prolific that we take it for granted. It's just there. And there's a lot of it that's gone. If you go to downtown rodeo, don't go during when the traffic's heavy. But if you go to downtown rodeo and you look across the street from the business district, you'll see a historic sign and it says Rodeo Train Depot. That's where it was. And right next to it was a large railroad compound community with track workers and other railroad employees. And just, it was a large part of the rodeo community. If you want to know more about the social history of, of rodeo, and you want to know more about, because I'm going to touch on it today, but the man that knows more than anybody else is Junior Gomez, who's outside right now selling this book. And if you want to know more about the EPSW in the rodeo area and in the Animus Valley and in this part of the world, buy this book. It's really good. It's a love, it's a love poem to rodeo. So let's head down the road. Railroad, so to speak. The reason why there was a railroad is because there was a town of Bisbee. Bisbee, was, uh, ore was discovered in Bisbee just a short time after ore was discovered by Ed Schifflin in Tombstone. They discovered minerals in uh, Bisbee in Tombstone Canyon. It was a rude mining camp, very rude place, up in, in, until about 1885, 
when a company called Phelps Dodge and Company decided to expand its operations and already invested. Dr. James Douglas had come to Bisbee and looked over properties for Phelps Dodge and said, buy the Atlanta claim. It looks good. And so they did. And as it turned out, just about any place that you could stick a shovel in the ground in Bisbee, you would find copper ore. And not just copper ore, fabulously rich copper ore. 25% copper. And if you know anything about mineralogy, mining, uh, you know, when you've got 25% ore, that's like cut chain. So Bisbee went from a very rude mining community in 1880, 1881, to the vestiges of a modern industrialized society, an urban outpost on the frontier. This is later on, but this is what Bisbee was becoming already in 1885 when the Copper Queen Consolidated Mining Company was started. It was a holding company for all the different properties that Phelps Dodge had accumulated already in Bisbee. And they were accumulating more and more as time went on. So you've got mining going on. You've got a lot of people who knew what their neighbors were doing because they could look right down their chimneys. And you had smelting going on. This was a modern industrialized city in the middle of the desert. <coughs> now, you dig the copper out of the ground, you mill it, you smelt it, what do you do with it from there? Now you've got 375 pound ingots called anodes. 99.95% pure copper. You gotta get it to market. One problem was, there was no railroad to Bisbee. Bisbee's up in the mountains. Really, there should be no reason to be a city there at all, except for the fact it was sitting on top of fabulously rich deposit of copper. So to get the copper to the closest railhead, which was Fairbank, now located on Highway 82 on the San Pedro River, a short distance north and west of Tombstone, to get the copper to the closest railhead, they had to use, and, I, and somebody told me these were 20 mule teams. Well, I counted them. There's 40 mules pulling those wagons right there over the mule mountains. This is expensive. This is time consuming. This is not good business. So by 1886, Dr. James Douglas and the other folks from the Phelps Dodge Company were looking at alternatives to get the copper to the market. What's the most efficient method in the 19th century to transport goods? Railroads. So by 1888, they decided we're going to build a railroad from Bisbee to Fairbank. And it's going to be kind of like a fish hook coming out of the south of Bisbee, around the west of the Mule Mountains, up close to between the San Pedros and the Mules, up to Fairbank, where it will connect with the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad at that place. From there, they can take the copper wherever they needed to take it. So, 1888, they start the Arizona and Southeastern Railroad. It's a totally Phelps Dodge owned company. Phelps Dodge officers, Phelps Dodge uh, people own all the stock. So no interference from anybody. By 1889, by February 1889, this little engine here could, this is engine number one, and, this, and, and those of us who are math majors can plainly tell that. <laughs> and that is, that is the moment that train chugged into Tombstone Canyon. Now, if you want to say your respects to engine number one, just go over to El Paso downtown to the visitor center and look at that locomotive in there. That is that engine. It survived. Give it a hug and tell it we're still thinking about you. So all of a sudden, copper becomes a lot cheaper to transport, which is good for Phelps Dodge, uh, for everybody, and as far as their investors are concerned, they're all happy. And at the same time that this more efficient means of transporting the ore to the market comes to pass, there's this tremendous demand for copper. What's going on in the world? Industrial revolution is proceeding apace. Telephones and electricity, electrical light, electrical motors, all of a sudden copper is not just for making brass and for lining the bottoms of sailing ships. It is in a very important commodity in the modern industrialized world. So Bisbee's got a railroad. But the Phelps Dodge folks are not happy. One reason they're not happy is because they were not getting the rates they wanted or the respect. They weren't getting their props from the Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe folks. So they decided, 
we're going to bypass these rascals in 1894. They built another extension from that 36 mile road. They added another 18, uh, almost 19 miles to Benson to connect with the Southern Pacific to bypass the Santa Fe Railroad. So now the Bisbee Road, out, out the Arizona and Southeastern Road extends from Bisbee all the way to Benson. But it's not enough. They keep producing more and more copper. The demand is going up, but the supply is just going up too. They keep finding more and more copper and acquiring more and more mines. Other companies are springing up too. There's no place to smelt copper in Bisbee sufficiently level to be able to deal with the volume of copper that's coming out of the ground. Plus, they were killing every plant and a lot of people in that canyon. So, Dr. James Douglas decides we need to build a smelter someplace else. They looked at the Naco area, decided that wasn't going to work. They looked at an area 25 miles southeast of Bisbee on the plain, close to the Mexican border, and that's where the town of Douglas was founded. It existed as a smelter community to produce copper for Bisbee and then to get it to the refineries over in El Paso. That's the smelter over in Douglas right there. So they start building a railroad to Douglas. 1900, they changed the name of the railroad from Arizona and Southeastern to Southwestern Railroad. And there's wheels turning in James Douglas's head and his son Walter Douglas's head. Why stop there? Why not extend this railroad further? So they built the railroad down to Naco, they built it along the border, down to Douglas, and they started expanding the road east. And then in 1901, they decided to go for it. And they said, we're changing the name of the railroad from the El Paso and Southwestern, or El, uh, excuse me, Southwestern Railroad to the El Paso and Southwestern. So in 1901, it was incorporated, and they went lickety-split constructing that road. In a matter of months, they had built all the way from Douglas, across the state line, up to here, took a hard right turn, and all the way over to El Paso, along with other extensions from Deming, going down to what is now um, Hermanas, and from Lordsburg to Hechita. And here's the there were depots in all these places. And what we're going to see is that every 20 to 40 miles, depending on the grade, depending on how the trains were supposed to stop, there were going to be sidings. And at these sidings, there would be water tanks. Because steam engines can go these beautiful, big, complicated routes, raw power, needed water and fuel, just like human beings. But they needed vast amounts of water to generate the steam that was producing the motive power for those trains. So every 40 miles, these brutes had to stop and gas up or, or tank up with water. So that's why you have all these stops along Highway 80, Chiricahua, Apache, Bernardino, Rodeo, Animus. These were all places for the trains to stop, take on water, take on coal if needed, drop off passengers, pick, off, pack up, pick up passengers, do the same thing with freight, and deliver the mail. Trains became important. And as that track was being built, these spots were being named. So by 1902, the town of Rodeo was there. First, it was just a train depot, but train depots attract businesses like flowers attract bees. So pretty soon after you get a train depot there, somebody's going to build a store, somebody else is going to build a hotel because passengers have to have a place to stay. And all of a sudden, you have towns. Hachita, the replacement for old Hachita, was, uh, was a El Paso and Southwestern Railroad stop, and it was an important one because that's where train crews would lay over before they'd start back on their original routes. So each one of these places had its own particular purpose. Some of them were more important than others, but every one of them served an important part of this community. And all of a sudden, instead of a few honest ranchers and a lot of stock thieves, you started having larger communities out here. And it became pretty much what it is today. This is the Douglas Railroad Depot. It's two stories. It's now the Douglas Police Department. It is an absolutely gorgeous building. It's got a stained glass rotunda in the waiting room. 
and it's also got tons of marijuana in the property of the evidence. <laughs> now, if you want to know where the Bisbee right now depot was, this is downtown. This is right across the street from Twee's Noodle Shop, if you know where that is in Bisbee, which is where the star of Bisbee 17 works. Is that where the parking lot is? That's where the parking lot is today, is where the depot was. Now picture how congested old Bisbee was with trains coming in and out. They went in back of the post office. Commerce Street in Bisbee, if you know where the back of the post office was, was a siding for railroad trains. You had to be careful when you're in that congested in an urban area with all these trains. There was a roundhouse very close to there too at one time. And this is what they were transporting to El Paso. This is 99.95% copper. My wife spent a year at San Manuel chipping impurities off these things. That's 375 pounds, and you put a bunch of those in a car, and you send them to Douglas or to El Paso, where they're going to refine them into 99.999999% copper, which is commercially usable for wire and whatever else you need it for. That's the El Paso refinery. So that's where it was going. But you got a railroad. You got other reasons to have a railroad. You can run passengers on it. You can run freight on it. You can do all kinds of interesting things with a train. And if you're smart and capable, you can make a lot of money. So immediately, the El Paso and Southwestern started competing with the, um, the Southern Pacific in a friendly way because they didn't, at this time, they didn't end at the same place. EP and SW ended in Benson. Southern Pacific ran all the way from California all the way across the eastern um, part of, the, of Texas. So this, this is a different market, but it's going to change. And here's the EP and SW line. It's truly impressive. It went at its, at its greatest extent from Tucson all the way down where we are right here, Rodeo, all the way to El Paso, and then up to Tucumcari, New Mexico. They ran excursion trains to Cloudcroft uh, Cloud in the summertime to be, beat the heat special. They also ran spur lines to Dawson. And if you've ever been to Dawson, New Mexico, it's not too far from Cimarron, New Mexico, to the southwest of Raton. Dawson was a coal mining town that was owned by Phil Stodge. Smelters need a lot of coal. They need the coke that coal can produce to create the, the heat in smelters to be able to smell ore. They would bring this coke down from Dawson to Tucumcari and then on this rail line here that they shared with the Rock Island line. Now, Phelps Dodge was a wash in money. They were making a tremendous amount of money selling copper. Copper was good. They had the, one of the world's best supplies of copper and they could sell it as fast as they could produce it. So they were able to finance railroads. They were able to finance newspapers. They were able to finance and build all sorts of beautiful buildings in every town that they, that they had mines in, Renzi, Tyrone, all those towns. And they were able to build this beautiful railroad. And these are two of the smaller stops right around here. So had you come through here as late as the 1940s and 50s, you would have seen these buildings at Bernardino. And right here, I just learned today, that's Rob Orozco's house right there. He's got this on a piece of property over by Animus. They picked it up and moved it. So it still exists. Now, the road system we have today, and we all took Haiti to get out here, what does it follow the whole way? It follows the railroad. Why did they do that? Why reinvent the wheel? These railroad engineers knew the best grains, they knew the best routes to get around obstacles. So when they built the roads coming out here, and this is from the Arizona Good Roads Association book of 1913, this shows the swinging hot spots on the way from Douglas up to Rodeo. All they did 
was follow the PNSW. So the railroad came first, just like the railroad on I-10 came before the SP. Or um, I-10, the SP came before I-10. Romeo was uh, an important stop on the line because this is where trains could coal. This is where trains also could pick up water, but uh, they also had section crews here. And most uh, of the major stops along this line and any line would have housing for the employees whose job was to maintain the track, maintain the right of way, do the things that were necessary to keep that track in good operating condition. And they had to go out in horrible weather during the monsoons. I'm sure they dreaded going out there because they had to clear out whatever kind of obstructions would build up in bridges and culverts, repair any track that had washed out. So these guys were just as important, the section hands, the laborers that lived across the road from downtown rodeo as the engineers and the brakemen and the conductors. And these are photos of the rodeo um, uh, depot before it was torn down. And if you want to see what the rodeo depot looked like, go to Columbus, because it's a clone of the rodeo depot. They were pretty much cookie cutter, you know, they used a template for different size depots. And the only ones that were truly magnificent depots were the ones in Tucson and Douglas, and they were works a lot. In 1915, Arizona went dry, January 1st. New Mexico did not. So, if you'd come to rodeo in 1915, 1916, it was hell on wheels. <laughs> there, were, there was a row of saloons and apparently body houses right there on, on highway, where Highway 80 is today. Arizonans would come over here to drink or place their order. Here's an enterprising fellow that owned a saloon in the Gulch, the Hermitage, which is no longer there in Ruby Gulch and Bisbee who put this ad in the Bisbee newspaper. Bisbee residents, you want some booze? I've got this big warehouse in Rodeo and I'll be glad to fill your personal orders. <laughs> now that was in one day. The next day, he put this ad in the paper. Apparently somebody from the El Paso and Southwestern tapped him on the shoulder and said, uh, we're not doing this. Yeah. The same thing is going on today in Colorado. If you drive from Raton, New Mexico, over Raton Pass into Trinidad, you get to Stark, Starkville, which is a suburb right on down slope towards, towards the, uh, where Trinidad starts, and you look on both sides of Interstate 25, there are cannabis stores for out-of-state users of marijuana. So Colorado's doing exactly the same thing that Rodeo, New Mexico did 100 years ago. And if voters, or if, if the state approves legal recreational marijuana here, you may end up with a green cross dispensary in either Road Forks or Rodeo, who knows? And these are two um, sketches that Junior Gomez, who wrote this book, don't forget. Junior did these sketches of the Rodeo Station. I got these at the Lordsburg uh, Hidalgo County Museum, and they're really nice sketches. And again, this is a clone of the Columbus Station. And then there's the station at Aramis and Hermanas, two very important stops as well. And if you go around downtown Aramis, and I know that sounds a little grandiose, <laughs> but if you go around downtown Aramis, you'll see foundations and the residue of a thriving commercial district that basically died because the railroad is no longer there. Look, I will this one. And this is the one in Columbus, and it is exactly like the one, again, that existed in Rodeo. It's a museum now. And from what Junior was telling me, and this makes perfect sense, he worked in the station for a while, and he said there were bullet holes all over it because it was right in the line of fire when Pancho Villa attacked Columbus on March 9th, 1916. This was the terminus for the railroad to El Paso Union Station. And if you take Amtrak from anywhere, either the Texas Eagle or the um, Sunset Limited, you'll stop at this depot. That's Beautiful building downtown. Now, originally, the building of the tracks was by hand. And just like they did the Union Pacific and the, and the Central Pacific, the first transcontinental railroad, 
So you had the same kind of thing. You had people, they had to grade the line. Engineers would go out and lay out the line, figure out where they were going to plant it. And then the graders came along and smoothed the surfaces out, did the cutting and the filling, so that the railroad would have the most level possible track that, that could be done. And then the track layers would come out and install the track. And that's the way it was until the early 1900s when suddenly we have mechanization. Steam shows can do the job a lot better and faster than it did just raw muscle. So they started doing cuts and fills with steam shows. So now we've got a railroad from Benson to El Paso, but it's not enough. They decided we need a, a larger, more expansive railroad. We want to take it all the way to Tucson. So in 1910, they announced their intentions. We're going to build from Benson to Tucson. And it's going to be close to the Southern Pacific tracks, but it's actually going to be laid better than the Southern Pacific tracks. They didn't go through the Cienega, the swamp. They stayed above the ground. And if you'd gone to Tucson uh, any time a couple of years ago, you would have seen many, many Union Pacific locomotives parked on track out there. That was the old EPNSW line that they were using as a parking lot for their spare locomotives. They built another depot in Tucson, and that's it. It looks very much like the depot in Douglas. Doesn't have the strong smell of marijuana coming out of the property and evidence room, but it is a truly beautiful building. When I, when I left the Sheriff's Department in 1986 to go back to school and get my teaching degree, that's where we had Carlos Murphy's restaurant. It was a restaurant until the um, late 1990s, and it's been empty since then, but it's still a beautiful building. So now the railroad extends all the way as of 1912, all the way from Tucson to Tucumcari, New Mexico. 1,000 miles of trackage, most of it in the state of New Mexico. And here's the line. And notice this line up to Tyrone and the line up to Clifton. Those weren't spur lines. The railroad, if you, if you lived out here and you wanted to take a trip someplace, you would probably, if you wanted to travel in the daytime, you would have gone on the Southwest Flyer. That was the EPSW's main passenger train. They ran one each way, east and west, every day. So you'd get up in the morning, you'd catch the train in, in anywhere along the line, but if you started at its terminus in Tucson, it would take you all day to get to El Paso because when you got to Hachita, you make a hard left turn and go up to Clifton Morency and pick people up there. Why the interest in Clifton Morency? Who owns those mines? Phelps Dodge. And if you were taking the nighttime train, it was known as the Drummer Special, because drummer being a term for salesmen, the salesmen like to take the night train. They get a berth, sleep overnight. They get to their destination in the morning just in time to go out and start to try to sell stuff to different companies or businesses. So those trains had first class and coach accommodation. They also had parlor cars where you could sit and, and eat from the a la carte menu. That's passenger trains and a mixed train, dining cars. A couple of historical things that they did on this, on this route, the first modern round-the-world trip was in the 1880s by baseball teams. It wasn't very successful or noticeable. 1913, the New York Giants and the Chicago White Sox took a trip around the world, started in Cincinnati, Ohio, traveled across the West Coast, and from El Paso, they came right down here through Rio, New Mexico, and played a game in Douglas, the first major league baseball game between two big league teams in Arizona. It was played November 6, 1913. These, uh, the second one was played in Bisbee the next day. And these teams were packed with talent. Now, this is a year and a half after the Titanic went down. Baseball players were not real eager to cross the ocean. So some of the regular players said, I think I'll pass on this one. And they stocked this team with talent. So when, they, when this team, when these two teams took the field at this ballpark in Bisbee, on November 7, 1913, we had six future Hall of Famers and Jim Thorpe, who just won the pentathlon and decathlon in Stockholm, Sweden on the field. Thorpe hit a home run that day to impress his wife. <coughs> 1915, Pancho Villa attacked Agua Prieta. Agua Prieta, uh, the, the garrison there was greatly outnumbered. 
His army was between Agua Prieta and any reinforcements. So the United States government let the Mexican government send eight troop trains from El Paso, Texas. They entered in, in Laredo and Eagle Pass, came across Texas, and then came on this rail line. Had you been in rodeo that day, you would have seen when they stopped. You would have seen Mexican troops here getting off the train. Pancho Villa attacked as a consequence of these troops going to Agua Prieta and reinforcing the garrison. He was bloodily defeated. It was still at the beginning of the end for Villa. And next year, in retribution, he attacked Columbus, also on the PNSW. And of course, the most important thing that happened, in my, my mind, was the Bisbee deportation. So on July 12, 1917, those miners that were on strike were rounded up at gunpoint by vigilantes. 1,186 of them were packed into this train and shipped along the El Paso and southwestern to Columbus, New Mexico. These men who were kidnapped filed kidnapping charges. That didn't go anywhere. What happened to O.J. after he was found innocent? They took him to civil court. And in 19, 1918, 1919, and 1920, each year, more and more of the deportees joined a class action suit filed by the union, the IWW, against the copper companies. It was set in. The, the case was called Simmons versus EPNSW Railroad et al. So the railroad was the primary defendant in that class action lawsuit. Railroad was finally sold in 1924 by the, to the Southern Pacific Line. It continued to operate here until 19, December 1961, I believe. It was the last train that they ran on it. And there it is. Goodbye, Columbus. <laughs> so this is the story. It is the story, and there's a lot of it left. There is the tunnel between Bisbee and Douglas. There's track with... with Trees growing in between, lots of bridges. The roundhouse still exists in Tucson. The railroad is no more. All of its stories are just stories now. And everybody that rode that train and everybody that worked that train is long dead. But it is the reason why we are here today. It played an important part. And hopefully, one of these days, we'll have railroads here again. So, and I hope that day comes when you can go down to rodeo and, and a train will pull up and somebody will say, all aboard. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Where did they get enough water for this? Um, out of this they pumped water. Um, each one of these these stops, each one of these sidings, like a rodeo, had two wells that the company maintained, and they had to keep the pumps and the wells in good operating condition at all times. Two of them, in case one didn't work. There were, there were water stops along the way. There was one every 20 to 40 miles out there between there too. As a matter of fact, Highway 9, east of Columbus, is built right over the old railroad bed. That's why you don't see it anymore. The New Mexico Highway Department said, why, why waste this beautiful road? And they just built right on top of it. One more, one more question? Yes, sir. Uh, some of these locomotives are uh, coal-fired, uh, were any of them wood-fired, or is that the same? And what did they do for fuel? Where did that come from? The coal came, it was all coal-fired up until the 1930s. They started using diesels for the passenger trains, but they continued using coal for the uh, steam trains. That, that coal came from Dawson, New Mexico, which is a ghost town. Dawson is also the site of the second biggest mine disaster in the United States. 263 men killed in one day. So that's where it came from. It came from New Mexico, the same, the same place where the coal was used for the smelter in Douglas. That's why Phelps Dodge owned it. Okay, so there, went, there weren't wood fired. There were coal. By that time, coal was a far more efficient way to do it. And uh, coal is also easier to store than wood. So it worked out for them. And, and Phelps Dodge could buy their own towns, buy their own mines. Thank you very much.